In insurance, past claim behavior is very predictive of future claim behavior. Actually, it is the single most predictive source of information used to determine if a customer will make a claim. But if we built a model using only claim history, it wouldn't be very good. In general, model features should come from a variety of different information sources. So your approach to feature selection should aim to create a shortlist of the most predictive features from each distinct information source. However, it is not that simple. In industry, we can sometimes deal with thousands of features with unclear and overlapping base sources. So how can we boil this down to a short list of say 20 to 40 features? Hi, I'm Connor and welcome to ADO. In this video, I explain how you can use a combination of variable clustering and feature importance to create a shortlist. I will also explain the key factors you need to consider when selecting features. The most important is predictive power and predictor variety. But there are also other considerations that may result in a feature being added or removed. These include data quality and availability, feature stability, interpretability, and law or ethics. We end by discussing how all of these considerations come together in a feature selection framework. To start, let's clarify by what we mean by feature selection. In the model development process, feature selection happens after feature engineering and before we start fitting models. During feature engineering, we transform our raw data into a list of model features. Depending on your problem, this list may be large. That is over 1,000 features. Feature selection involves narrowing this down to a short list of between 20 and 40 features. Depending on your model, there could be another stage of feature selection where you select a final list of model features. For linear models, this can be around eight or 10 features. We will focus on the first stage, creating a short list. We create a short list for a few reasons. During the model training stage, it is computationally expensive to use the full list of features. Even before we start training models, we will want to explore the features to understand their relationship with the target variable. There's also a lot of work that goes into testing the features. It is unnecessary to do this work for all of them. This is because the full list will contain both redundant and irrelevant features. Redundant features are two or more features that capture the same relationship. To better understand this, suppose you want to create a model to predict if someone will default on a car loan. Let's assume for each customer, we have access to data on monthly income, default and arrears history, existing debt obligations, and some personal information. During feature engineering, you will create many features from each of these sources using different aggregations over different time periods. Take the three features created using income. We can expect them to be very similar. We could also expect them to be predictive of default, but they would all capture the same underlying relationship between income and default. This means that once we have an income feature in our model, including an additional one would not improve the model's accuracy. We say the remaining income features are redundant. We want to exclude redundant features from our shortlist, even if they are predictive. We also want to remove any features that are not predictive or should not be considered for some other reason, such as if it is illegal to use the feature. These are known as irrelevant features. For example, suppose we create a feature using the customer's income from 20 years ago. This information is outdated and would not tell us anything about their current financial position. The goal of feature selection is to narrow down the list by removing as many redundant and irrelevant features as possible. To do this, the main considerations are the predictive power of the individual features and predictor variety. We can loosely define predictive power as the ability of a feature to predict the target variable. Practically, we need to use some measure or statistic to estimate this. 
A common measure is correlation. Other measures include information values, mutual information, and feature importance scores. The different measures will all have their own upsides and downsides. What is important is they allow us to compare the features and prioritize those that are the most predictive. However, if this was the only thing we considered, we would not end up with a very good shortlist. To continue our car loan example, suppose we have created this list of features. This is our full list of features, and we have ordered them using feature importance. In general, we can see that the features based on default history are the most predictive. This is because a customer's past default history will tell us a lot about whether they will default in the future. So suppose we took the 20 most predictive features as our final shortlist. You can see that we would end up with many redundant default features. This problem brings us to the second factor we should consider, predictor variety. To avoid having many redundant features, we need to consider how different the features are from each other. To do this, we should first create groups of features from the full list. The groups should be constructed so the features within a group are similar to each other and different from the features in the other groups. Now, if we took the most predictive features from each group, we would end up with fewer redundant features. The question is, how can we create these groups of features? We could do it manually using domain knowledge, or there may already be an obvious grouping. For our car loan example, we could create six groups, five main data sources and one combination of income and debt. Here, you can see the default and income groups. With both groups, the features have been ordered by feature importance. We could then take the three or four most predictive features from each group to give us a short list of 18 to 24 features. Now, it may seem like a contradiction to select more than one feature from each group, as it would result in some redundant features. We must keep in mind that measurements like correlation give us a solitary measurement of a feature's predictive power. The same feature may become more or less predictive when used in a model with other features. And we do not know how the features will behave in the context of the other features. So we eliminate a lot of redundant features, but we still give ourselves some wiggle room when finding the best set of features for the final model. For many problems, it may be difficult to manually group the features. You may have too many features. The underlying data sources also could be more complicated even for our car loan example, it's not clear that the six groups would be the best possible grouping. For example, one of the features in the personal group is current occupation. It may be better to include this with the income features. To address these issues, we need a statistical method for creating similar groups. These are known as variable clustering methods. We explore one of these in a later video hierarchical clustering. This method aims to group variables that are highly correlated. Variables within one group should be highly correlated and at the same time not correlated with variables in another group. You can also use other clustering methods like k-means. The difference is that you use them to cluster columns of a data set and not rows. So using variable clustering will help us remove redundant features. Using a measure of feature importance will help us remove irrelevant features. We may also want to remove features that are irrelevant for other reasons. And there are also reasons we will want to include some features, even if they are not predictive. If you're interested in this type of content, then make sure to sign up to my newsletter in the description. You'll get free access to an explainable AI course, where I give an introduction to XAI, teach you to build interpretable models, and go into depth on the theory and Python code for model agnostic methods, including Lime, SHAP, PDPs, Iceplots, ALEs, and Friedman's H statistic. There are six key factors that we should consider. Firstly, we need to consider data quality. A feature may be irrelevant, but it has poor data quality. We should be concerned whenever we expect recorded values in our data set are different from true values. For example, Data could be missing or entered incorrectly. Often, poor data quality means a feature would not be predictive and excluded anyways. But this is not always the case, especially when mistakes are systematic 
or data is not missing at random. In some cases, data may be open to manipulation by the user or a third party. Take our car loan model. A user may be asked to provide their personal information such as country of origin or occupation. The user may be tempted to provide information that gives them a better chance of getting a loan. For example, they could falsely state that they have a high paying job such as a doctor or software developer. We need to verify independently that these types of features are correct. We also consider data availability. Models are generally created within a development environment. To use the model, it needs to be moved to a production environment. Due to various technical problems and costs, certain features may not be available in the production environment. In other words, the data is available to train models, but not for the models to make predictions in real time. To have a working model, we need to exclude any of these features. Even if these features are excluded from the final model, we may still want to include them in our shortlist. This will allow us to still explore the features. If we can show that they are predictive, it will help justify the work and costs involved in productionizing them for future models. We must also consider the stability of features. Just because your features are predictive now, doesn't mean they will be predictive in the future. Over time, Relationships between a feature and target variable can change, and the relationships captured within your model can become outdated. For example, the COVID pandemic caused sudden changes in customer behavior, impacting the models trying to predict that behavior. To better understand this, let's go back to our car loan example. Suppose before the pandemic, we built a model using Purse 7. This is the number of physical branch visits in the last 12 months. At the time, customers who tended to go to the bank more often were less likely to default on car loans. Come the pandemic, lockdowns meant many interactions moved online. This means fewer branch visits and we would have seen a decrease in this feature for all customers. From the perspective of our model, the drop in per seven is an indication of higher default risk. Although the true default risk for many of these customers would not have changed, the model would now still predict higher probabilities of default. There are many other potential changes within and outside your organization that can affect your model in this way. You need to try your best to consider them all and choose features that are robust to these changes. If you're not new to the channel, then you know this next factor is a personal favorite of mine. So far, we have talked about creating features using simple aggregations like average and minimum. There are also more complicated feature engineering techniques like principal component analysis. Using this method, we could take all the features in the income group and calculate the principal components. We could consider including the first PC in our shortlist. This may be more predictive than any of the individual income features. However, we may still only include the simple aggregations of income in our shortlist. This is because the relationship between default and total income is easier to understand and explain than one with a PC. As we discussed in a previous video, there are many ways to capture the same underlying relationships in data. In general, we can prioritize one way above the others to improve the interpretability of our model. Law and ethics is also an important factor. There may be certain types of information that is illegal to build a model with. For example, to avoid gender discrimination in lending, customer gender may be illegal to use. Even if legislation doesn't currently cover these types of information, you may still want to avoid them as they may lead to unethical consequences and public backlash. Counterintuitively, you may still want to include these features in your shortlist. This is so algorithm fairness assessments can be done. You cannot determine if your model is biased towards a certain gender if you do not include gender as a feature. These types of variables are called protected features. They should not be used to build models, but can still be included in a shortlist. Finally, the last thing to consider is that there is usually a lot of analysis that comes with the model. Sometimes this analysis isn't directly related to the model build and instead we want to answer specific questions. 
For example, do customers in certain regions have different default rates? Or do customers who tend to interact online have higher default rates than those who visit branches? It would be handy to include any feature needed to answer these types of questions in your shortlist. In the end, all the above considerations need to be formalized in some way. This is where a feature selection framework comes in. It will outline the technical details of your approach to selecting features, including the measure of feature importance, the variable clustering method, and how many features to select from each group. You can also define your approach to handling the other considerations, such as what analysis is required to determine if a feature will be stable. This framework will be part of a larger modeling framework. Along with feature selection, it will define the approach to feature engineering and the type of model used. If you're interested in a key aspect of the modeling framework, then check out this introduction to algorithm fairness. Otherwise, you can find loads more similar content in this playlist. And remember, you can get my XAI course for free with the link in the description.